running and gunning, Kai is on his heels and working up an appetite hunting moose in Finland. Staying with the need for speed, I am in Ireland with the English keeping coursing alive. We have news, we have hunting YouTube and we have the winner of the Caddyshack Goblet Catapult. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Game cook Kai is often after one for the pot. I need Tabasco. But here in central Finland, he's got the chance of one for the pot and one for the people. Here's the hard heart and here's the lunch. The heart is actually quite low, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So if you, get, if you go for a heart shot, then... We're after a moose and a black grouse, and both with a rifle. In fact, the same rifle. This morning, it's moose, and it's all hands and paws on deck. The elk hounds are crucial for this type of hunt, and the Finns take their dog work seriously. They have a reputation for being serious about everything, but we'd suggest hunting dogs, drinking, rallying, sauna are what they take the most seriously. Yarko is our host, and he wants Kai to put some rounds down range with his Zauer 404 with very large orange bolt handle. No fumbling for that on a cold, wet winter morning. If he decides to shoot birds later on today, we can swap it back and you know, everything's all in one case. So it's quite compact. He's found the best bullet is the lead-free Barnes Vortex. I was just speaking to Yarko and he was saying to me that the, the 9.3 calibre is the most popular calibre for moose for just going straight through the, through the branches and uh, straight to the target. Not used it before. It'd be quite interesting to see how, how that goes. Yarko and his business partner Matty organise moose hunts for one up to 14 people. The grounds are vast, so more hunters, more chance of shooting a moose. We also have some quality dogs, and from what we can tell, they're the game makers. Plus, Yarko and Matty use high and low tech kit to discover what's about. Low tech is thin cotton threads hung between trees. If it's broken, something big has passed through. High tech offers a bit more detail. This is the bull that Yarko wants Kai to take, and that's where we're heading now. That's good. Ready to go. I'm excited. Yarko is constantly juggling phones. It's a modern way of hunting. How much has technology changed moose hunting in the last 10 years? I can say quite a lot. Yes. In the old times, we just let the dog out and we only have to listen where it starts to bark. Yeah. And then, but now we have all this. Look at the GPS tracking. Yeah, we have the GPS tracking. You can see the dog, the other hunters. Here is our place. So the idea is if these come across moose, then we will nip back and then we will head over to them. Yeah. This uh, dog here is working, is working this area for us yeah. in this location. Yeah. Okay. On the app itself, you can see the dogs and their patterns and the way they're moving. And these guys can tell when it's on the, the scent of a moose. It counts how many barks the dog's doing. So the dog shouldn't bark until it comes up to a moose. So as soon as you can see the barks per minute ramps up, then you know the dog is on a moose. So we're literally just sitting there just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for this kind of moment to kick in. And when it does kick in, it's all go. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's too fast. Yeah. Okay. By the time I got him in the road, he's on the other side. It was a, a decent pool. Yeah. Not so big angles, but the size was decent. But yeah. So he's come, since I come here, by the time I come here, he was all, already halfway across the road. Yeah. Let's wait. Now they. It knows about us. And the next thing it stopped, it's going to stop. Somewhere. As the tracker software shows, the moose crosses but too far moose. in front of us. Too fast. I don't think I've ever seen you run like that, David. <laughs> now we can't move that dog. Just as we get our breath back, same dog, same moose. Yarko has us in a spot where he thinks the moose will pass. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> what an adventure that was. Yeah. That was pretty fast and furious. Kai's finished bull moose is lying 20 meters from the shot. What a day, Kai. Huh? What a day. That was absolutely incredible. I mean, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thank well you. Done. Thank you. I've never had a morning like that. No, absolutely not. That was an exciting morning, really exciting. All of a sudden, it all went pretty fast and furious, and uh, you could probably hear my breathing. I was a little bit out of shape. <laughs> we saw this guy. We followed it around using the tracking system, and we got in position. And with the, with luck as well, he came within our path, and I had like a really small window through trees to to take him and. Uh, what an amazing experience. Incredible. Thank you very much, honestly. It's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Yuri. Only one shot. Only one shot. Okay, very good. Super. <laughs> I think, this, to be honest, the star of the show is Donna. Me and Dave were watching her work on the tracking systems and in front of us, and what an incredible animal, it really is. Hey. Amazing day. So, oh. tonight, Sona. <laughs> that's some, uh, that's some nice cold drink. Cold drink and food, and uh, enjoy company and uh, much, celebrate uh, this uh, this beautiful guy here. Thank so, thank you very much. I shot my first moose when I was 15. 
15. Yeah. Wow. It was exactly the same <laughs> like this. <laughs> Just like small shaking. Board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I will always remember that moment. What got me is you were saying to me and David that when you were we were all following the moose yeah. and you were dri you were driving in your in your yeah, car. Yeah, I had to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was looking at the phone and thinking like, oh, you guys have to shoot it. It's so close. I and <laughs> and then I saw that the dog stopped and started like barking crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, I was texting with the dog owner. And we were wondering if you if you guys got it. If you shot the moon. Yeah. So yeah. you had to stop your car because yeah, you were so nervous yourself. I was almost shaking. Like, I was so happy that you got the chance. It's been a huge effort by everyone <laughs> to get the animal down. It's a huge animal yeah, and it's going like, to need just as much deer, help to get it back to the larder and to clean it. First, we have some Finnish hunting traditions to enjoy. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we, have a, we have a tradition here in Finland. Okay. A uh, man called Tapio is the god of the forest and wilderness. The guardian of the, of yeah. the forest. Yeah. Okay. Guardian. That's that's him on the front there. Yeah. Can He's we show? There. You can see there. That's not Yarko. That's Tapio. <laughs> I haven't even had me yet. <laughs> yeah, it's not me. <laughs> well, it does look a little bit similar, but anyway, carry on. Okay. So we we kind of uh, honor him and take. Okay one shot for the moose which to say he, thank you for yeah, which he has given the bull for us that's really that's a really nice gesture and uh, the first one who is taking is always the one who shot the moose that would be me then yeah just a little swig of half a bottle uh, just a little swig <laughs> at this time we still have some work to do <laughs> thank you Oh, that's nice and warm. Thank you to Tapio. A workout. <laughs> it's just normal now, isn't it? The extraction is neat and efficient but requires some <laughs> puff. Quite a bit of puff. Huh? Once or twice. Yoko sets up the trail cam to see what visitors we have to the Gralic. Back at base and the real work begins and another friend joins us. Evelina has been out bird hunting today with her Finnish spits and is another passionate hunter. With a tired workforce, Kai rustles up a quick bite using moose heart before a much needed sauna. So this is what I was doing last night, plunging myself into this freezing stream here. Invigorating experience, but something I probably won't do too often. I went in a man and come out a very small boy. <laughs> Thankfully, the sauna experience has not reduced cool. all of Kai's mojo, and he's got all he needs to make a moose kebab lunch for the hunting party. It's a beautiful spot, and again, it's all hands on deck. And put some uh, seasoning on it that I've made. Handheld food, perfect out here in this lovely camp. So this is the loin of the, uh, the moose, so it would be equivalent to obviously the sirloin of a cow. Do you know why it's called sirloin, David? No. Because it, I can't remember which king liked it so much, he knighted the loin of beef, so it's sirloin. 
What a great way to mark a successful, adrenaline fueled hunt and great teamwork. Next time we swap barrels on the Zauer 404 and Kai has to get comfortable pointing a centerfire rifle at a target in the sky. To find out more about Zauer's range of rifles, go to zauer.de. For more information about the blazer clothing Kai has been wearing, go to blazer.de. And to hunt moose with Yako and Matty, email info at wildernessvuokati.fi. Thank you, Yako, Matty and all the dog handlers for making that work. It really is community hunting at its best. Now from sauna addicts to a man we'd like to see plunged into an icy pool, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Double standards from the RSPB. After years campaigning against controlled muir burn, which is carried out by gamekeepers to benefit grouse and other species, the RSPB surprised shooters by posting this video on Facebook. It shows reed burning carried out by the charity for conservation at its Black Toft Reserve on the River Humber. The RSPB says the reed burning benefits bearded tit, marsh harrier, reed warbler and so much more. The Princess Royal has opened a new air rifle range. Yates Town Council Outdoors Sports Complex near Bristol now offers target sprint. Claire West from sponsor Air Arms was there to greet the princess. Two photos that are taken just days apart in January 2019. 7,000 hunters protest in Oslo about the lack of wolf shooting. A few days later, a few hundred antis protest in Oslo about too much wolf shooting. Hunters are the only community that cares about wolves. Using two dogs to hunt foxes is more cruel than using a pack. That's the advice to the Scottish Government in its own review on hunting. Yet it's planning to bring forward legislation that will do exactly that. By proposing a limit of two dogs that can be used to flush out and shoot foxes, Rural Affairs Minister Marie Goujon will seriously compromise effective pest control in the country, according to Lord Bonamy's review for the Scottish Government. The Irish Government has had to defend a deer cull. More than 30 wild deer from a herd in Dublin's Phoenix Park were culled in what the Irish Office of Public Works, or OPW, said was an effort to manage its size. One anti told the Irish Times, shooting deer in view of other deer is barbaric. All animals experience fear at seeing their friends killed, as humans would. And the Irish Times printed it. Duck shooters in Australia are furious that their shooting season has been cut by three weeks. The Victorian Game Management Authority maintains that duck populations are at an all-time low. Anticipating this, the duck shooters have been running a campaign on social media, showing photographs and videos of huge numbers of birds next to the hashtag, we know where the ducks are. Now they want a refund on their hunting licence because the season is nine weeks instead of 12. A woman in Oklahoma has to be more careful when using dating apps. Chatting to a match on Bumble, she boasted about shooting a deer and she admitted in her chat to lamping or spotlighting the deer, which is illegal. Unfortunately for her, the guy she fancied is a game warden. Cannon Harrison from the Oklahoma Game Wardens team made further inquiries and busted her. She and an accomplice pleaded guilty and paid £1,900 in fines. A fox has gone on the rampage in a couple's home. It left such a mess that they thought they'd stumbled on a murder scene. <laughs> Malcolm Gerrard, who's 58, and his partner Katie Haywood went downstairs to investigate a huge crash in their kitchen. The fox cut its paws on broken glass, leaving blood all over the floor, and bit painter and decorator Malcolm as it tried to escape. And finally, our friend Colin Lockerbie got in the way of a running red deer hind last week. Maybe it's good luck to have a wild red hind run out of the trees and hit you square on. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Before we go coursing, here is a personal touch from Sacco. Who needs off the peg? 
Now coursing, they've banned it in the UK, but in Ireland they print the results in the newspapers. I go there to have a look for myself. Would you like to come back as an animal? If you're coming back as a pet, as livestock, can I recommend you consider being a champion coursing greyhound? The massaging, the praise, and the sheer blooming enjoyment of doing your thing. If you want to come back as a wild animal, it has to be a hare born somewhere the locals enjoy coursing. You get to live in parks especially designed for you. You get wormed and a full healthcare plan. And all you have to do is race up a 420 yard field and occasionally outmaneuver some muzzled dogs. I have come to a field in Kilkenny in Ireland to watch the English Invitation Stakes Champion Cup, where English greyhound enthusiasts have come to pit their dogs against each other. Liz Hall and Jackie Teal are owners and trainers from Yorkshire, who have had four Waterloo Cup winners between them. Well, I, I inherited my interest from my parents, who were quite keen on coursing, and circumstances just went by. I was never that interested in the training of it of them, but just family circumstances. I ended up doing it really. You become passionate about it. Well, it's, it's the dogs and what your achievement when you put so much work into them and they and the, the go out and win. It's just a, a good sport and the dogs hopefully give you back, put, give you back what you put into it. Um, you, you love your dogs, I mean, it's a space. It's a yeah. I mean, when, they, when they retire, they all get rehomed. Quiet. Um, so. Yeah. Is it about the, so it's more about the dogs than about you, really? <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah, it is, yeah. There is plenty of silverware on offer here and some keen owners chasing it. I've got two in the, in the final. The, you both of yours are in the final. <laughs> Please don't record that. That's good, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to be modest. <laughs> have, you, um, have you won English stakes here before? Uh, I've been a bridesmaid an awful lot. <laughs> The, the answer is not really. <laughs> yes, I, we used to when we started. And then we had a bad patch. There is a big difference between coursing and greyhound racing. Here's a trainer who trains both. Uh, obviously, coursing it's it's just only two dogs, and the best dog, you know, t tends to win uh, on the track. There's a the six dogs, or should be six dogs, and there can be a lot of uh, hard luck stories on the track. While they are here, the English enter their dogs in other stakes. Aaron Atmore has been training an old dog called Fond Memories, who's out for the last time as, you might call, a professional athlete. Most of the course in Greyhounds would go to the third season perhaps, and he's already on his fifth, so he's an OAP in effect, but he's still as keen as mustard and, and he's qualified and he deserves his place. The fact he's here, the fact he's qualified and, and won a stake to get here is, is probably more than the owners could hope for. He's won a, a huge number of stakes in his time. Um, it's been a great dog for him and uh, it's basically swan stomp, so. <laughs> First up, the dog gets a proper rub down with special oils. He's got eucalyptus in. Some people make their own. Some people buy greens, rub is a popular one. I hate the stuff, it burns my hands. So I use this, it's called Professional's Choice and I just mix one or two other bits in with it. And they have uh, the coursing muzzles. Um, these have been developed by the ICC. You have to have a leg, the current one, you can see it's stamped there. That's for a bitch, that's for a dog. It's just slightly longer. You can see the, the extra piece on. That's the only difference. It's designed to not, obviously, damage the dog, but also, should they get near a hair, just to not allow them to hurt it, you know, to bounce off and uh, protect both the dog and the hare. So it's, uh, when they first come in, perhaps contentious, but I think nothing but positive um, for the sport, so. This dog will be a pet eventually, but he's a working dog. His whole function has evolved over thousands and thousands of years to become the ultimate sighthound. 
he hunts, his eyesight is the prowess, the way that the muscles work, the way that the whole structure of this dog is evol has evolved, is to hunt by sight, to course prey, and the, the hare is its natural quarry. There is a beautiful balance as well, that the hare has speed, but it also has agility, and it has endurance where these are absolute speed masters. So these will close very, very fast on the hair. And at the last moment when you think all's lost for the hair, the hair can turn with its own body length. And these dogs vastly overshoot. They might go 10 yards, 12 yards, 20 yards past, gather themselves, compose themselves, and run again at the hair. Uh, and every time the hair jinks again, getting more valuable space until it's reached its cover. And once these dogs can't see because they've hung by sight, then the, the course is over. And as you can see, the average course here today would be in the region of 12 seconds. Um, now, it doesn't sound a lot, but it's, it's a very thrilling 12 seconds to see the pace and the agility and the speed of not just the dogs, the hares, and, and the distance covered. The, the field here is about 420 yards long, um, and they're covering that distance in, in a very short space of time, showing real pace. When Aaron gets to the start, the steward checks the dog's ID card. On the front, the fond memories, the earmarks, the registration, the volume of the stud book it's in, various details, and then it's markings, they're done by a steward, PJ Roberts, who's actually here today, did this one. Uh, you can see the name of the dog, it's a brindle dog, the date it was whelped, the sire, grand sire and grand dam, the dam and the details there. The original owners were Tommy's Legacy Syndicate. Um, it's changed ownership to June, Douse and Danny Begging here. Uh, that's under the National Coursing Club in England. This is the Irish Coursing Club. Um, and every time we go up, we show this so that they know that it's actually that dog going in. It is a passport, yeah, it's an ID card, and it ensures that that dog continues to run. Obviously, it'd be quite handy if you could just change it around in a second round for another one. So it uh, avoids all that, uh, and that stays with the dog everywhere. <laughs> The exciting moment comes and fond memories steps out for what will probably be the last time. I was beat down here and all the way up and um, as, I, as anticipated, I mean, you know, it's, like I said, it's done great to be here, I'm just... It was very close. It was close enough for him, but he, a pitch of that age and that quality against uh, an all-timer like him. The years tell and the, the work tells, so, but that was good, that was great. You can see him coming off now, we have a heap of people up there catching up for us, so they'll bring them back down and then we'll start working on washing them down, cleaning them, rubbing them down. I always went coursing, I was always involved in the slipping, and I was involved in the slipping because there's only <laughs> the slipper actually coursing. Everybody else is watching. He's got the dogs. He's got the the hair. He's assessing the hair, making sure it's a good hair, making sure that he's got everything going for it to test the dogs to the full and make sure it escapes. And um, he, as I say, he's so integral to it. Um, it's one of the greatest thrills of my life when you're walking out with a dog and the dogs are there and the hair's been passing, it's a good hair and you're moving forward and you're trying to get the beat of the dogs going. You're watching the hair all the time and you're feeling the dogs through the slips. And at the moment you just get to that point when you've got enough law and the dogs are running with you and you just drop that barrel and the leather eases out and flush. And the pace, you're running as you let them go and they're gone. In two or three paces, these dogs are up to 35 mile an hour, 40 mile an hour. And that is just stunning. And to see them home in on the hair and then, like I said, that last minute, that jink, and then boosh, past, and the hair just swing on and go straight to its escape. The crowd loves it. There's the same passion for dogs here as there is for horses at the races, and they're firmly on the side of the hair. Here's what happens when a dog gets too close. Jason Doyle, who presents our Field Sports Ireland show, is here, and he did most of the filming for this piece. He doesn't understand how the British government got coursing so wrong. And there'll be government officials here, there'll be government vets here. It's all very well regulated, but I mean, coursing has been going on so long here, and it's I mean, it's proven to benefit the hair population. Um, areas that are managed for coursing 
have an awful lot more hairs in areas that aren't and that's that's proven by independent scientific studies. The greatest thrill is when it's your dog that's running. Here is an owner watching his dog. Whoops, he's behind. Oh, he's well beat here. You can tell that already. Yeah. Oh, I knocked the it! Good boy! Good boy. That's the boy. Come on, get her home now. Good boy, get her home. Let her home. Let her home. Good boy. Yeah, survived again. Just tell me what happened now. Yeah, we were just seemed to be left uh, coming away from slips, and uh, he just seemed to get his, his 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 gears in at midway and just ran real well. Now, yeah. Did you reckon he won that one? Yeah, yeah, he did well. Yeah, did well. Did really well. Yeah, yeah, we're thrilled. The English have to cross the Irish Sea because Tony Blair banned coursing in England and Wales from 2005. Tony Blair only restricted hunting with hounds. He prohibited coursing. Yet coursing is good for hares. Research by Queen's University Belfast shows that where there is coursing, there are 18 times as many hares. It seems a strange thing to a lot of conservationists or people who are against coursing, but we actively conserve hares, whereas a lot of people talk a good story. Um, and it's in our interest to make sure that conservation measures go. We have the landowners on our side as well, which is really important to ensure that there's set aside, that there's places and feed for hares, that the farming practices encourage high hare numbers and that obviously then encourages a whole other, a plethora of flora and fauna that uh, benefit from that conservation measure. We join the team in charge of hare welfare at Seven Houses. They're all tagged, they have their tag numbers, the lads put in their hands here and they just pull up the ear and they read the tag number. And I have my book then and they have them Good, very good, no good, yeah. or offline, Miller. offline, no slip. Have you given them names? Uh, the boys, the young lads have names on some of them, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's a typical name for hair? A uh, white You, 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 you could have a white face, you could have a white arse, <laughs> you could have a, a cut in his ear, stuff like that, do you know what that? Yeah, they used to have a... Can we call one Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> no good. <laughs> yeah, they're dosed uh, for, for worms and, and fluke when they come in. Yeah. And um, do you feed, have, feed do you have anything down for the feet and the, the, the feet we do the, yeah. the, the, the dip their, their oh, feet and the um, fast and they put a sponge in a bath yeah. in a place yeah. you have to run through. So that then when they run over they're cleaning the feet because the it's feet infected. get a lot of you get a lot of little injuries around the feet and if they go septic or something you can set the, them right back so by doing that you're just keeping them clean. Old clubs used to put a bit of lime down didn't yeah, they as well so they walk through the lime just to get rid of any of that but the, but the feed you're giving them as well is um, they'll get shaves Cheese, and, and cheese, and yeah. cheese, and they'll hang those because they naturally like to stand up and eat. So they'll hang them up on the put heads in on the knees. Up at the top, you'll see that, and then they'll put the sallies in. Now, yeah. sallies are, are basically a willow, and they eat the bark off that. So how do they catch the hares in the first place? Hares will always go for a gateway, so you set nets on the gates, and then the lads come along to hunt out the fields, and the hare, the hare won't run for the ditch; he'll go straight for the gate. We'll catch them like I say, and then they'll bring them here and then they dose them as they put them in and tag them so we've got a record of where they come from, yeah. where they're netted and then at the end of this meeting the wildlife officer he'll check he'll out the numbers and he'll come with us then and release them and he'll go and, he'll and release them back, back. Go you've got nine there and you've got seven there and you've got whatever yeah. it might not be the same nine go back on purpose no, to make sure that the, then you're mixing the blood up so they're not inbreeding all the yeah. time you've got yeah. that, yeah. you're creating a stronger line by yeah. The cousin's not breeding yeah. with his cousin. Back to the coursing and the hares are running well. Better than the dogs. The judge announces the winner. He's looking for a first turn or good speed. In the event of a straight up with no turn, you judge it on the dog that shows the most superior speed, leads most of the way. Um, I'd have a mark. Most judges would have a mark on the other side of the field, about 20 yards out, so the course would be over by then. If they do turn, are you looking for the first turn or the strongest turn? The first to turn the hair, yeah. First to turn. The first to turn the hair yeah. is basically the winner? Yes. Okay. And if they turn it a couple of times, does that make a difference? No, nothing not in the park meeting. Open coursing now would be different. Um, so we just judge on the first turn. 
When the hare is safely through and into the park, a white flag goes up. Do the hares suffer from stress and depression like city workers? No, they don't. When they're being horsed and they're put back in in the evening time, yeah. you go up there the next morning and see what they're after eating. Yeah. So they're settled down. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't put them off their food like. It's exactly the same as being in the wild. If a fox chases them, they don't then just run round and yeah. for hours. As soon as the, the, the chase is over, they go back to doing exactly what they was before. It's natural for them. That's why yeah. they're still here. Muzzling the dogs was not popular among the Irish when they adopted it in 1994, but it has saved coursing. And there's an important distinction now in the Irish countryside. You see an unmuzzled dog chasing hares in a field, someone's poaching. I wasn't fired originally, but without the muzzle, we wouldn't be here today. Coursing has a long and illustrious history. The Grand National Horse Race in Aintree was set up as a diversion for people going to Coursing's Waterloo Cup. They put up bronze statues to winning dogs in market town centres. How would, you, how would you describe a Waterloo Oh, compared to anything else? Well, for amazement, it's the best winter holiday ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was an annual holiday. The year just got off in 2003, I think. It was like a death in the family. So, we're more saddened by the Waterloo Cup after we would be about a death in the family, I'm telling you. Lads went, lads went that night. The, fall, the first night they were meant to go, and they went, the news called off, and they went on the board. It's our holiday, they said. And the English were great, beyond we, we got great respect for the English. And, the banter was unbelievable. Any horse racing courses with the word park in them, Kempton Park, Haydock Park, were originally for coursing. All knockout competitions with 64 starters, such as Wimbledon Lawn Tennis, are based on the Waterloo Cup. So how do you take up coursing? It'd be pretty easy to get into it, wouldn't it, Liz? Oh, yeah. yeah. How, how do I come along and watch something? Do I just turn up and get... up, yeah. That's pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we rejoin Sally to see how she does in the final of the English Stakes. It's difficult from the sound to see who's leaving. I think she is. Good girl. You can't from here tell. Oh, that's brilliant. A little bitch, that's really good news. I'm absolutely thrilled. We got her from the Dibbley's last year. I bought her at about this time last year from them. And she's been gradually improving the whole of the coursing season. Jackie rated her, Jackie the trainer rated her. I actually thought the dog was the better bet, and she's won. And in my preference, I would always love to see a good bitch coursing because they sort of get down and they really work. And I love watching them. If you want to get involved with coursing, look up your national coursing club on Facebook and find out about upcoming meetings. It's just nuts that Tony Blair banned coursing. Those animal lovers that voted for it, they must have really hated hares. What do you think of coursing? Please leave a comment below. Talking of comments, many of you left the comment, I love rubber. We've written all your names down, not because we're reporting you to the authorities, but to enter you into a competition to win a goblet catapult. And I'm looking at my phone because that's where I put all your names into a random name generator app. Can you believe that? Now, you're all there, all 400 of you. Apparently all I have to do is shake and it chooses a winner. And the winner is, oh, I can, I can even get it to say the name. Listen to this. Dave K. I love rubber. Nice shooting. YouTube. Dave K. I love this. Brilliant. I love these apps. Dave K. We will get in touch with you. You ended on YouTube. You got the words right. I love rubber. And a Caddyshack goblet will be going out to you as soon as we have your address. Now, from shiny slingshots to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. <laughs> This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Liam Lynch of Primal Nomad Bushcraft gets in touch about this film. He booked up with Childerly Sporting to go on his first Chinese water deer stalk, and he filmed it too. Former German hunting magazine editor Dirk Waltman takes his old friend UK stalker Leo Naylor out after Chamois in the Karnik Alps, a lovely stalk. A big hunting trip for Swedish channel Yaktar Yakt, where they end up getting a fox. Nice clean shot. In New Zealand, hunting outfitter Waikara Moana is hunting two fallow deer for venison using a 22 
250. Row stalker Greg is catching up with his cull plan. In his area, row does are grouping around oilseed rape fields, which makes them tricky to stalk. But the hope is there's always one. And there is. Over to the USA and Minnesota's Jim Scully has waited more than 300 days for opening day on the ducks. This is part two of Scout Look Weather's three-part Do Work series. KYA Field loads up with the Miles family and heads to the coal mines of eastern Kentucky to run the beagles and chase bunnies. It's eastern Kentucky coal country family rabbit hunt. And finally, I find it hard to forgive a film that opens with a statement including the words treacherous mountains. But I forgive Koryak Snow Sheep of Russia by J. Alan Smith, which has him out on the Kamchatka Peninsula looking for bighorn. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click the like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube and you can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about the show Field Sports Britain. It's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can back us. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out about that. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. <laughs>